discussing with us on a very important topic today. You recently spoke at the Congress on uh, neuroviral anticoagulants. For many years, heparin and warfarin has been synonymous with anticoagulation, yeah. but now we have an armamentarium of newer anticoagulants. What's your take on that? How they are uh, going to affect the management of uh, patients who needed anticoagulation in cardiology? Phenomenally, because uh, non-valvular atrial fibrillation is on the grow, in, in, even in our country, all over the world. And after almost 55 years, we have something which is challenging the old treatment. They are smooth by way of side effects, uh, easy to manage, uh, very short acting, and uh, there are so many advantages of the newer anticoagulants that we have to change our mindsets and shift to the newer ones for non-valvular AF, uh, thromboembolism, uh, that is venous thromboembolism, pulmonary embolism. So this shift will take place. You were specifically mentioning about non-valvular uh, atrial fibrillation, yeah. non-valvular indications. Uh, what's uh, about the valvular indications? What does the study say? Valvular is still the domain of the warfarins or cumidin derivatives. Uh, these newer anticoagulants are not tried in valvular AFs or they are contraindicated in prosthetic valves. So it is a uh, non-valvular AF and related thromboembolism. There were few studies on acute coronary syndromes as well. Yes. Uh, can you uh, tell us more about that? It's still budding actually. Uh, Rivaroxaban especially can be used more for acute coronary syndromes as compared to other. Uh, but it's yet to be approved by the FDA and yet to be practiced by all of us. But I would say that uh, Dabigatran has the longest experience for uh, systemic stroke prevention. Apixaban, Edoxaban, Rivaroxaban are all almost reaching there and we'll see that in the years to come we'll be talking uh, mainly about these Novaks rather than the old warfarins. What is uh, your take on uh, the agents? There are many agents so is it one is better than the other or all are same or how do you... Uh, uh, Once a day on? advantage is with river uh, All trials are very robust. They have done more than for 15,000, 18,000 patients. So there is uh, little to choose between one from the other. But if you have a highest chance of stroke and less chance of bleed, I would put Dabigatran 150 milligrams as the drug of choice. If you have a renal dysfunction, then I would put Rivaroxaban or Apixaban is uh, slightly better. And uh, Edoxaban is making the uh, entry too. You also mentioned that atrial fibrillation is increasing in Indians as well and uh, any particular reason for that or any particular way to detect it and how the physician should uh, be carefully looking for it? I think it is just uh, improved longevity and probably more awareness as well. It was a disease which was thought to be of old age and was probably getting neglected. So as we have done these trials, even in uh, Dabigatran trials, other trials, we have been involved as Indian patients. And we see the number is not small at all. And so we have a large population which is now beyond 60, 65 years of age. Hypertension is rampant. People are living longer. And that's why I think uh, this is going to be a real problem. It's already a real problem for India too. So that brings to a very interesting point. Uh, most of the elderly have a lot of other comorbidities. Yes. And uh, when we add any new drug, it actually uh, there are chances that may interact with other medicines as well. So any word of caution on uh, oral anticoagulants, specifically <laughs> <in> elderly? <laughs> no, no. In fact, that's the USP because these drugs hardly interact with any other drugs. There is no food drug interaction like warfarin. There is no drug drug interaction. So in fact, with comorbidities, except maybe the very end stage renal dysfunction, these are very good agents to be used in these conditions. Any particular thing regarding monitoring of them? Because warfarin used to require a lot of monitoring. That's again one of the strong points that it doesn't require monitoring. We have been getting fed up with monitoring the prothrombin time INRs of uh, individuals, the lab inconsistency, the cost involved, and the complications related to warfarin based on INR management. But all this is uh, sort of gotten rid of by these new agents. No monitoring requires fixed oral dose, and uh, you just keep feel very safe with them, actually. We have talked about a lot of benefits, uh, but uh, many people say that there are no antidotes as of now. 
Yeah. So what what would you your take in case the patient is bleeding? What should a physician do to manage it? The antidotes are not required, in fact, because the pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics is so safe, and because we know that a certain drug level will be achieved, and that's why this monitoring is probably not required. And also they are short acting. So if if there is a life threatening emergency of bleeding, a patient is already on Novak and meets with a road traffic accident which needs hyperacute management, then it will be dealt with with whatever. But if you have little time, then all you have to do is stop one dose. And it, by the time the next dose comes, probably you are ready to operate the patient. That short acting period also helps in these individuals. Thank you so much for your clear and uh, answer and guidance on the role of neuroural anticoagulants. Any final word from you on that? Yeah, I think we have hit with a discovery almost after 55 years. And all that we have to do is change our mindsets and get into the new, drug, new drugs, which will help the society to reduce a life-threatening and probably nerve-shattering complication like a stroke. Thank you so much, sir. Now, this brings to us to a second topic uh, today, which we wanted to discuss with yes. you. Uh, most of the patients who develop uh, ST elevation MI yes. during the chronic phase, during the rehabilitation uh, phase, they generally receive four drugs. Yeah. One of them is uh, renin angiotensin receptor blockers. Uh, so what's your take on that? We have primarily two forms of therapy. One is largely bucketed under the ACE inhibitor category and second is largely bucketed under the ARBs. Yeah. And within them there are various uh, drugs. So before we go to individual uh, drugs on those categories, what's your take on the large as a whole? Uh, how, in which situation wish to be preferred, any choices or all are same? Or? For the traditional wisdom, I think ACE inhibitors, no doubt, and uh, largest, of course, experience is with uh, Ramipril. And that still remains my drug of choice for somebody who has had a ST elevation MI. Before he goes home, we need to put him on uh, uh, Ramipril, a good dose. I end up building them up to almost 10 milligrams despite a normal blood pressure. And we realize that that kind of gives the longest uh, advantage to the patient as far as for future events are concerned and morbidity and other things are concerned. Definitely this is related to, uh, uh, this is as I said traditional wisdom coming from our uh, uh, literature as well. The only place where I feel is for some reason we cannot give uh, Ramipril. Uh, where there is intractable cough or some other reason why we cannot use. Then the only ARB that can be used is Valsata. And I tend to use it whenever Ramipril cannot be used. But either which way, I feel that ACE inhibitor in this particular indication still scores over ARBs. And I am still, as I said, um, maybe a little old fashioned in this way, but I do not easily switch to an ARB when a post-MI patient comes to us. And more the LV dysfunction, more it is indicated. If a patient comes to you who is already an anti -hypertens on anti-hypertensive, is already taking a sartan, yeah. uh, would, the, if the patient develops an ST elevation MI, despite being, take, being on the drug, yeah. on the second day when the revascularization is, uh, priority is already taken care of, and now we are preparing the patient to go back to the normal life, in that situation, would you continue with the ARB or you switch to ACE or? I switch, switch. actually, yes. Sir. Because this is uh, certainly not from the literature. This comes from more from experience. And I feel I would be happiest when I switch to uh, ACE inhibitor because that is where it has the best indication. Otherwise, ARBs are crawling up and trying to take away some indications of ACE inhibitors. You mentioned about cup. How frequently you uh, see in your practice on ACE inhibitors because you are putting almost all the patients of post MI situation on ACE. In terms of percentage, if I have to ask you, what percentage of patients? Is it, is it something which has to be worried so frequently? Yes. Or? Actually, I feel that uh, cough develops almost in 15 to 20 percent of the patients. However, withdrawal of ACE inhibitors is required in single digit number. Okay. So I would say that about uh, 8 to 9 percent uh, one would be withdrawn of Ramipril or uh, other ACE inhibitors if because of intractable cough. But other than that, there is, uh, we have not seen so much of angioneurotic edemas and other things. The only probable problem with the ACE inhibitors is the intractable cough. And as I said, the withdrawal of therapy takes place only in a single digit number. And it all depends on also a little 
convincing the patient, making him understand the importance of the drug. These small things also help actually to retain the patient on ACE inhibitor. Any, any indication, any indication where you think that ARBs will score over ACE in a patient who has a post-MI other than if he is intractable cough, other than that, any other condition? Uh, nothing that I can think of really, uh, not from my own experience and not from the literature. Really. Thank you so much sir, yes, it was sir. really uh, exciting yes, talking sir. to you and it's the knowledge which you provided is going to be really helpful for the audience. Uh, thank you so much. Sir. Thank you.